If you were stranded in the jungle with a species of hyper-intelligent super chimpanzees hunting you down, what would you do? What started off as a simple college research trip has quickly spiraled into a survival situation, but Mother Nature isn't all we have to worry about. Between killer apes that want us dead and our psychotic professor tried to use us as bait, our chances of making it out of here alive are slim to none, and that's assuming we make good decisions along the way. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat blood monkeys in blood monka. Professor Hamilton is a man possessed by a singular obsession. He's entirely unconcerned with the trivial ambitions of lesser men, like money, fame, or pleasure. Instead, his sole preoccupation is the relentless pursuit of planet Earth's most elusive of beasts, the legendary Blood Monkey. And it looks like today is his lucky day. After countless years of exploring the jungles of Africa, the professor's men have finally captured one of the hulking apes in a wooden cage. He better get a move on, though. These Lincoln logs ain't gonna hold forever. And I highly doubt Furious George is planning to stick around for an interview after it tears your little toadies limb from limb. Suddenly, communications cut out, and without the ability to receive further instructions from HQ, the critter getters freeze up in a panic long enough for their quarry to bust loose and start mowing face. By the time the professor and his bodyguard, Chen, arrive on the scene, all that remains of his henchmen is a few handfuls of taco meat scattered around the cage. <laughs> I hear you, Doc. It's so hard to find good help these days. Clearly, these clowns drastically overstated their monkey wrangling abilities on their LinkedIn profiles. I mean, they didn't even think to run a simple comms check from the ambush site to make sure they could contact the boss. That said, real professionals would have only needed the radio to let Mother Base know once Diddy Kong gave up his last balloon. Also, what kind of trap was that? Yeah, no shit, a bunch of bamboo sticks wrapped in yarn didn't hold the grog. We're not clubbing for baby seals here. A game like this requires staked concertina wire and reinforced steel. As for the trappers themselves, one car 15 between the three of you ain't gonna cut it. If we're planning to give peace a chance, one of us should have a high-powered tranquilizer rifle ready to go with plenty of extra darts. Otherwise, how exactly were you planning on moving this thing once you caught it? However, if that fails, the other two should be equipped with automatic rifles and the balls to use them before they get ripped apart. Art. Once the blood monkey enters the trap, we should trank it immediately and maybe throw in a few safety shots for good measure. But if I see the bolts backing out on that cage by so much as a hair, I'm calling prairie fire emergency. I'm lighting this sucker up on full auto until I can read through it. Besides, it's not like it needs to be alive for science purposes, right? This video is sponsored by Doomsday Last Survivors, a zombie survival strategy game where you get to LARP as the Nerves of Steel hero that leads fellow survivors back to your shelter so they can man the walls and be the frontline defense while you manage the resources in your office. One of those resources could be one of the $1,000 worth of Amazon gift cards they're giving away for playing. In case you 18 to 24 year olds didn't realize it, to survive the apocalypse, you need to utilize everything you can find to stop the relentless zombie waves. That means volunteering your fellow survivors to reinforce the shelter walls. Find who has what it takes to go beyond the fence, train your troops to not shit themselves the second a zombie jump scares them, and to recruit the heroes who make it back with your Twinkies. Command top down from the armchair by texting diverse battle strategies to your troops in the field. And from your realistic spherical satellite terrain drone view with exceptional zoom capabilities hovering over the Horde Knight, let your heroes know when to use their super cool skills and attacks they've been working on. Win a giveaway of $1,000 worth of Amazon gift cards by either a might ranking where the top one player will win a $200 Amazon gift card, a $100 Amazon gift card based on the power ranking, or if you're lucky, you'll win a $50 Amazon gift card at random. Click my link in the description to download now and join the novice events to get the legendary hero Zombie Hunter. The next zombie wave is coming. Looks like the professor's gonna need himself another crew. Fortunately, he knows just where to find one, and on the cheap. After all, why go through the hassle of actually paying your employees to risk life and limb hunting murder apes, when there's plenty of eager interns out there willing to do it for college credit? Oh look, here they come now. I'm having second thoughts. 
Chill out, bro tank. I'm sure your parents said the same thing. Now let's see who's on today's menu. We got Greg, the loudmouth jock, Sydney, the superficial cheerleader, Josh, the bumbling nerd, Danny, the peppy videographer, Seth, the brooding loner, and Amy, the plank of wood. So yeah, it's basically the breakfast club with giant monkeys. Anyway, this merry band of undergrads think they're here to document Hamilton's expedition into the unexplored reaches of African jungle, which is why young Danny hasn't put the camera down since they left the airport. Nice shot there, Peter Berg. Can't wait for Master Chief to find all this hard-hitting footage when your little field trip turns into a massacre. After catching a Land Rover ride from the airstrip, the gang files in behind their edgelord leader, Seth, and his GPS as they make their way up the winding trail to the rendezvous point. Eventually, the sidewalk ends, and without any indication of where to go next, they decide to settle in and wait for the professor to come and find them. However, it seems something else finds them first. A rustling from the nearby foliage alerts the students to a pair of menacing yellow eyes peering out from the shadows. But before the big ugly can jump out of the bushes and rip them all to shreds, the indomitable chair swoops in out of nowhere and scares it off with a well-placed road flare. Talk about perfect timing. Lady Rambo literally showed up at the exact moment they were about to get Blood Monkey. 15 seconds later, and it would look like someone blew up a thousand pounds of lasagna out in the forest. I know I'm probably supposed to say something about getting on your feet and trying to appear larger to ward off the threatening animal, but yeah, this is Africa. Out here, unless you've got some firepower, you might as well just stick your head between your legs and kiss your ass goodbye. Of course, that's all the more reason why our intrepid interns should be questioning the legitimacy of this entire thing. What kind of operation drags six people halfway around the world just to leave them sitting helpless in a jungle full of apex predators? Might want to try asking Chen what that thing was, so at least we have some idea of what we got ourselves into. Although, she doesn't seem like the talkative type. After finally making it to base camp, the students wake up the next morning to a well-rehearsed introduction from Professor Hamilton. You hit the jackpot here. We have all hit a jackpot. Really? Even those three dudes that got manscaped the other day? With everyone sufficiently hyped, the gang begins preparations for the long trek deeper into the jungle, but it's not long before even more red flags begin piling up. Sydney confronts the group to find out which of them stole her cell phone, only for them to realize that all their cell phones have gone missing. It turns out Chen went through their bags while they were getting ready and swiped anything that they could use to reach the outside world, which apparently includes makeup kits too. According to Hamilton, it's just a precaution to ensure that nothing gets leaked. He then proceeds to pass out the blood type bracelets that clearly have some kind of chip in them. Can't wait to see what those are for. Not sure why he couldn't just ask us to hand in our phones voluntarily. Is academic espionage such a serious problem? You're willing to dynamite any chances of these kids ever trusting you again? If I had to guess, I'd say he's more worried about us contacting the authorities once we find out the real reason behind his little nature walk. Unfortunately, at this point, it's probably too late to take our ball and go home. Best case scenario, he'd tell us to hoof it back to the airstrip without an escort. And given what we ran into last night, that would pretty much be a death sentence. I'm not saying we should go straight to bashing Chen's skull open with a rock and swiping her Kalashnikov rifle, but we shouldn't rule it out completely in case things start to get weird. In the meantime, we should have Seth mark the location of the camp on his GPS in case we need to find a way back here on our own. After wrapping up the Orwellian orientation, the gang gets the show on the road, and it's not long before the group reaches their first major obstacle, a casual 200-foot drop down a sheer cliff. The only way down is by rappelling, which being standard coursework for any zoology major, everyone is totally stoked on. Sorry, Doc, looks like this is where we get off. I can't let you do that. Damn, already? I figured it'd be at least a day before we had this conversation. Instead of ordering Chen to execute Greg as a show of strength, Hamilton shoots for this speech check instead, claiming they'll be the first to explore the bottom of the crater. Apparently, that's all they needed to hear to actually go through with this, and soon enough, everyone's making the controlled descent into the history books. Well, almost everyone. It seems Josh is doing his part as the Melvin of the group and having a full-on panic attack looking over the edge. Lucky for him, Chen has a knack for motivating cowards in a gentle and nuanced manner. Oh, no! Oh, no!
Strange. Doesn't seem to be working. Quick, everyone starts shouting over each other with wildly differing commands. That ought to get through to him. Eventually, they're able to talk him down, I'll bet a little faster than is advisable. Great, now we'll have to take turns carrying you around for the rest of the trip. Although, at least we know who's getting gobbled up to buy the rest of us time to escape. So, it's not all bad. I thought we were gonna have to kick someone's ankle out. Sometime later, the expedition arrives at a well-furnished campsite that seems to have been set up rather recently. So much for being first. Might as well pack it in and wait for their study to come out in nature. Oh, I, I guess we're just going through their stuff then. That's cool. Naturally, the students call the professor out over this discovery, prompting him to admit he lied about not having been here before to keep them properly motivated. As for all the equipment, he and Chen packed it in by themselves before they arrived. And if you believe that, I've got a killer multi-level marketing opportunity for you. So first, he has Xenia on a top go rifling through our shit without asking, and then he flat out lies to us so we'd follow him off a cliff. You know what? I'm starting to think there might not be any college credit attached to this at all. It's not quite go time yet, but we should really start thinking of an exit strategy. Only problem is, we're probably gonna need Chen's rifle to have any chance of making it out of here alive. Fortunately, there are six of us and only one of her, and it doesn't seem like Hamilton's packing any heat. When the time comes, I say we wait for her to visit the latrine and then come over the top of the tree branch. They don't call it getting caught with your pants down for nothing. That night, the happy campers gather around the campfire to pour over a mysterious giant monkus skull over Hamilton's private collection. In fact, it's so interesting, no one seems to notice the blood-splattered zombie sliding into the rotation. <laughs> I'm surprised no one asked if he was okay. As the terrified students look on in horror, Hamilton and Chin quickly pounce on the injured newcomer and haul him back to their tent for immediate interrogation. Okay, now it's go time. They obviously know this guy, and judging by their reaction, it's safe to say they didn't expect to ever see him again. Plus, the fact that they aren't already on the sat phone calling in an evac chopper means they're definitely planning to let him die out here. I don't care what they've got going on in that tent. No amount of gauze is going to fix this. Oh, and would you look at that? Now Hamilton and Chen are digging a man-sized hole in the ground. I guess he didn't pull through. Something's not right here. Yeah, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. Is there anything about this entire undertaking that hasn't been shady as hell? Besides, if they're going so far as to bury the man in an unmarked grave, what do you think they've got in mind for the witnesses? Fortunately, at least one of the students sees the situation for what it is. Sydney's planning an early morning exodus back to the main camp, and she's asking for company, as if anyone would actually want to stick around after everything they've been through. Now, all she has to do is stay alive long enough to lead her friends to safety. Easier said than done out here. At some point, nature calls, prompting Sydney to leave the perceived safety of her tent and head for the latrine, only she's not alone. And this is no ordinary peeping Tom. I'm gonna waste you guys! <laughs> Damn, you could have at least tried calling for help. If ever there was a time to use the buddy system, it's when you're stranded out in the jungle, surrounded by vicious predators and criminally insane faculty members. I mean, you literally just saw some dude with the front half of his skull ripped off. Not to mention the fact that you're the point person for the upcoming escape attempt. After everything Hamilton's done to get you this far, do you really think he's just going to let you leave? The next morning, Amy barges into Seth's tent to let him know of Sydney's disappearance. Knowing she wouldn't leave the rest of them behind, he approaches Hamilton on the matter. The nutty professor claims he had Chen escort her back to the main camp first thing in the morning, which somehow Seth finds hard to believe. However, this attempt at pushing back lands him on the wrong side of the underfolder. Nothing says, I let your friend go home, like the implied threat of blowing someone's head off. Although given the way Hamilton's handling that AK, there's a chance he legitimately has no idea which ends the dangerous one. After getting the point across, he tells Seth mutiny will not be tolerated, and then orders him to rally the troops for a ruck march deeper into the jungle. Seth dutifully informs his fellow interns of the orders from the top, explaining that Sydney was allowed a safe passage back to camp, which thankfully, it seems none of these Neanderthals actually believes. Too bad they aren't willing to do a damn thing about it though. Yeah, now's when you storm the tent and string Zimbardo up at the nearest tree. We've got him five to one, and without Shen around to show him where the bullets come out, he might as well be swinging around a cigarette lighter. Speaking of which, I wonder where Hamilton's hired gun got off to. <laughs> 
Apparently, she's been dragging Sydney through the undergrowth since last night. Talk about a workout. Well, the good news is that if she was planning to kill you herself, she almost certainly would have done it already. I mean, it's not like Sydney's moving under her own power. That said, she's clearly banking on us not being able to make it out of here alive. After all, being left to rot out in the middle of a hostile foreign jungle isn't too much better than taking one to the back of the skull. Eventually, Chen gives Sydney the boot into a small stream and leaves her to her fate. Although, at least she was nice enough to leave her backpack behind. Regardless, it's not looking good for Miss Cheerleader right now. But she's not completely screwed yet. Once we recover from that roundhouse to the face, we should head back to where Chen teed off and tried following her back to camp from a distance. Fortunately, she didn't bother to blindfold us on her way out. So even if we lost sight of her, we might be able to navigate back using familiar terrain. That said, pretty much everything looks the same out here. It's too late now, but while she was dragging us out, we should have dug our heels into the dirt as much as possible to create noticeable drag marks we could use to retrace our journey. The last thing we want to do is start wandering aimlessly. It's basically the worst thing you could possibly do when you're lost, especially when there's blood monkeys around. Oh, look, a wrecked bamboo cage covered in tattered human remains. What a bizarre natural phenomenon. Looks like a great place to post up and await rescue. Before Sydney can start slathering herself in rancid human flesh to scare off any predators, Travis the chimp returns to the scene of the crime to do what he does best. Sadly, the moment she went tearing blindly through the vegetation, she was pretty much a goner. Just ask Teddy Roosevelt. The jungle is not your friend. Even if she somehow managed to avoid getting got by Grape Ape, the elements alone would have probably done her in eventually. Elsewhere, the rest of the group is following Professor Plum deeper into the jungle. All the while, Seth is leaving behind scraps of ripped up clothing as trail markers. While I applaud the effort, might want to space those breadcrumbs out a bit wider there. At this rate, you'll all be butt naked by sundown. A commotion from behind draws their attention to Chen as she rejoins the herd, leading the students to inquire about Sydney's status. But their concerns are immediately brushed aside when they ask how it's possible for Chen to have traveled to the LZ and back in such a short amount of time, the professor becomes agitated and tells them to get ready to move out. While their captor is busy staring at his Pokedex, the group gathers up on their own to discuss next steps. Having had it up to here with the monkey business, everyone agrees tonight's the night they'll make a move on Papa Kalash. A few a few hours later, the procession comes to a halt in a clearing. Upon inspecting the surrounding tree line, Hamilton decides this is the perfect place to make camp for the evening, despite the fact that it's absolutely swarming with dense clouds of biting flies. There's heaps of them. Huh, I wonder what's drawing them all in. Maybe it has something to do with that huge slab of rotting flesh hanging from the tree in plain sight. Yeah, don't worry folks, Chen's gonna toss that rancid rack of ribs a good 10 feet away. That'll keep the bugs at bay. Never mind any massive carnivores that might be in the area. Just then, Seth spots Sydney's necklace laying right where she scooped up the mystery meat. Smart move not calling that out right away. We have no idea how Hamilton, and more importantly, Chen, might react if someone accuses them of murder. As nighttime rolls around, the gang sits around the fire under the watchful eye of their heavily armed nanny, when suddenly they hear what sounds like the predator jumping tree to tree. Hey, Seth, now would be a good time to jab that pocket knife you're holding into her carotid artery. Whatever's making that noise will still be screwing around out here, regardless of who's holding the rifle. So, it might as well be one of us. Greg decides enough is enough, and demands an explanation from the professor, prompting him to finally spill the beans on his mission to prove the super chimp's existence. Naturally, everyone's mortified at the idea of being savagely torn limb from limb by an as yet undiscovered primate. But Hamilton assures them there's nothing to worry about. No, oh, they're not any more dangerous than any other animal in the wild. Wow, that's comforting. Remember when a single one of them took out three grown men like it was nothing? As for the massive improprieties involved with tricking a group of college kids into joining his little monster quest, Hamilton confidently pinky swears that they'll be so stoked on the fruits of their labor, they won't even remember getting hoodwinked by a madman into serving as the source of cheap labor. Now that everyone is either pissed off or terrified, the professor decides they should all just call it a night. But as you might imagine, the students are having a hard time drifting off into dreamland. Instead, they decide to stay up by the fire and loudly discuss their plans to hijack Chen's rifle some five feet away from Hamilton's tent. Seth boldly volunteers his tribute to go in for the steal once everyone's asleep. Except, why wait? 
fate. Everyone here now is on our side. Although, now might be a good time to bust out Sydney's necklace, just in case any of us are having second thoughts. Besides, if we all work together, we could stage a more effective ambush. That Chen is no slouch. I highly doubt Seth would be able to creep inside her tent without getting a new hole in his head. Instead, we should have some of our smaller and weaker group members, like Josh and Danny, cry blood monkey while Amy, Seth, and Greg post up somewhere close by. The second Chen crawls out of the canvas, we work her over with whatever we can find until she's nothing but a pelvis wearing a belt. As for Dr. Hamilton, I say we put one through each of his kneecaps and let his screams of agony draw in the wildlife while we slip away. Of course, it couldn't hurt to have some kind of backup plan if things go awry. Fortunately, Josh has us covered. If it gets really serious, we can always use this. What, are you trolling us right now? Put that thing away before something gets curious. It turns out Hamilton's still milling around in his tent, so the gang turns in while they wait for him to fall asleep. Suddenly, a freak storm comes out of nowhere and starts pissing rain, or so they think. I've never seen rain so yellow and heavily concentrated before. Oh god, why does it smell like bananas and throw up? Nah, that can't be rain. Must be the scent of infection wafting off of Josh's sprained ankle. Apparently, that's what Danny and Greg think it is. Dead serious. They even make him stick his leg outside the tent to keep the smell out. Little do they realize, this is just an opportunity Big Monkey's been waiting for. One of the apes seizes Josh by the ankle and drags him off into the jungle at breakneck speed. The sounds of his screams alert the others, and soon enough, a half-baked search party is formed, with Greg sprinting off ahead by himself. Dude, I know you feel bad for allowing your unbridled stupidity to condemn your friend to die, but you should probably just let it go. Like, what are you actually planning to do if you manage to catch up to this thing. Take it to death? Besides, it's probably already ripped his spine out by now. Those of us that didn't get yoinked into oblivion should use the opportunity to put the sneak on Chen. Although, we'd better be damn careful how we go about it, as she's probably going to shoot first and ask questions later. Regardless, getting control of that weapon should be our top priority right now. Without it, there's literally nothing we can possibly do to defend off another attack. Elsewhere, Hamilton sends Chen out towards what they believe to be one of two apes terrorizing the group. Let's hope he offers life insurance. Oh, look, something's moving. Better pop off a few rounds to see what it is. If video games have taught me anything, it's that only monsters and bad guys are vulnerable to gunfire. See, he's just fine. I'd mentioned something about not pulling the trigger until you know what you're aiming at, but she probably couldn't care less either way. Besides, she seems totally fine with this outcome. Not one to let a good tragedy go to waste, Shen removes Greg's belt and ties him to a nearby tree for a little live bait action. She then doses him one more time for good measure before setting the mood with a road flare and posting up a few yards away. I admire such a practical use of available resources, but her use of the flare seems kind counterproductive. Just the other day, you used one to scare off one of these exact same creatures. Why wouldn't it have that same effect now? Then again, I doubt Greg will be that lucky. Also, we should try and establish a direct line of sight from much further out, preferably with our backs against something solid. Primates are known to have phenomenal vision, so setting up right outside the kill zone like this is certain to get us spotted when they come in to investigate Greg's screaming. And of course, that's exactly what happens. Seriously, how did you not see that coming? You were so close to the flare, the light was reflecting off of your face. Unfortunately, by the time Chen realizes she's being watched, it's already too late, and she only manages to squeeze off a few poorly aimed shots before the blood monkey rings her out like a sponge. Well, that's just great. If Jane Wick didn't make it, there isn't much hope for anyone else. Speaking of which, I wonder how the other students are holding up. Hmm, looks like they're huddled together next to a big rock. Honestly, this is probably the best decision anyone's made so far. I mean, it's not gonna keep the apes from f***ing our day up if they really want to, but without any means of fighting back, our only chance of survival is to appear as non-threatening as possible. Nothing to do now, but sit tight and hope Greg's wailing keeps them distracted long enough to forget we ever existed. What are you doing? I have to go. Not after saying that, you won't. Again, what exactly is your plan once you get to him? For all you know, he's watching three of the bastards skip rope with his large intestine. Before Seth can find out, Professor Hamilton ambushes him out of nowhere and pins him against a rocket knife point. Although, it's probably for the best. Old Greg was only about five seconds away from getting his hairy coup de grace anyways. Just then, the professor notices Chen's looking a little bent out of shape and rushes to her side. Ah, shit. 
Looks like they got the AK too. Got a feeling this one doesn't end with a group hug. Realizing he's distracted, Seth takes advantage of the clear opportunity, staring him in the face and jams his knife through Hamilton's windpipe. Nope, he actually just stands there and calls him out for using them all like human power bait. Dude, this guy was literally just about to kill you for trying to save your friend. Nothing you say to him right now is going to make him see the error of his ways. And besides, old Ahab's just getting started. I am just about to succeed. Do you realize what's being discovered here? Oh yeah, this whole operation just reeks of success right now. You do realize it doesn't count as a discovery if you die without anyone ever being able to find out about it, right? Summoning every last ounce of his old man strength, the mad doctor Falcon punches Seth so hard it nearly knocks over the set piece. With no one left to frustrate the relentless pursuit of science, he uses the bird dogs embedded in the blood type wristbands to track down Danny and Amy so he can get this little documentary rolling again. Despite outnumbering him two to one and being right behind him as he stares obsessively into the tracking device, the girls just mindlessly follow their tenured tormentor as he homes in on the beacon attached to Sydney's wristband. Sure enough, a piece of her is still hanging around, which Hamilton thinks would make a great thumbnail shot for when he uploads this whole thing to YouTube. Go! Get this! You heard the man, start rolling. This will be perfect for the blooper reel. Apparently, we're left to believe that in addition to forming complex traps, these things also have an innate grasp of GPS technology and the foresight to know that Hamilton would ultimately come looking for the arm. I guess these must be the apes that went on to blow up the Statue of Liberty. Fortunately, before they're left to actually make any decisions for themselves, Seth cashes in on his last remaining respawn and leads them back to camp, only it looks like the blood monkeys beat them to it. And that's not all. It seems they also made off with all the trail markers Seth left leading back to base camp. But don't worry ladies, Les Stroud's super positive he remembers where each one was. The breadcrumbs were just there in case you smooth brains got separated after things went to sh well, better start running aimlessly through the jungle. You know, it's too bad no one here actually thought to bring a compass with them on this adventure. Then at least we'd know which general direction to run in before we're ultimately chased down and savagely beaten to death with our own arms. Speaking of which, looks like Danny just got got. Yeah, you already know what I'm going to say, but f it. Leave her behind. Unless they're willing to wager her life in a battle of wits, there's absolutely no chance of you being able to do anything to help her. And even then, I'd still probably bet on the chimps. At least she got her camera. Now we can record our last will and testaments before the same thing happens to us. Realizing the apes must be close by, Seth starts chucking flares like it's DRG, seemingly buying them enough time to make it to a nearby cave. Hey, look, it's decorated with all the trail markers. I know this is the most cliched piece of horror movie advice out there, but for the love of God, do not go in there. Clearly, the apes have already been there. What, do you think they set it up as some sort of finish line for you? <laughs> Oh, Holy sh**, dude, you absolutely do. I'm honestly starting to think you're secretly working for the chimps. Oh well, it's a good thing you tossed your one remaining road flare back towards the exit. It's not like you need to see down here. Nah, it's fine. We'll just have one of us use the totally unrealistic night vision filter on the camera while the other stumbles around blindly in front of us. It worked just fine in quarantine, right? No, the answer is no. And just like in quarantine, this is where our story comes to an end. Suddenly, Amy cries out in terror even though she can't see anything. And we're left to watch through the camera as Seth is dragged away to certain death. Now completely helpless, the final girl curls up on the floor and awaits her grisly fate at the hairy hands of the blood monkeys, and they oblige. In the end, there were no survivors. However, had the students taken our advice on multiple occasions, they could have easily overpowered Chen and taken a rifle well before the sh** started to fly. Ultimately, had we been able to turn things around fast enough, I think we could have made it out of the crater before the apes became committed to violence. And for that reason, I think Blood Monkey was beaten. Moral of the story? Never be afraid to leave your friends behind.